The 2018 United Nations IPCC report mentions that present CO2 emissions have reached a crisis. Unless we curb our consumption and emissions within the next 11 years, our land's ability to sustain humanity will be irreparably harmed, causing our civilization to collapse. In medicine, we have a saying, your life or your limb. Say you have an infected gangrenous foot and you ask me to treat you. I tell you, we must amputate your foot now. You beg me not to amputate, so I explain that no doing so will cost you your life. This is your choice. Will you take your chances and hope it gets better? Would you play Russian roulette with your life or trust me as your expert doctor? The United Nations IPCC top experts warn that unless we take urgent measures, our civilization and most life in the planet will become irreparably damaged and will collapse. The United Nations experts, like us medical doctors, can warn and advise what we cannot force. So it is up to each individual to take responsibility and to take measures to avoid this dire outcome. It is only by working together that we can save ourselves as time is of the essence. I recommend two solutions to the problems facing us, and these are much less painful than cutting off your foot. If you follow these recommendations, you will become happier, healthier, and more prosperous. By following this advice, future generations will inherit a world in which they can live with dignity and peace. In order to reach our goals of a healthy and sustainable future, we must address two key points. Number one, population growth, and number two, the food we eat. First, let's see how we got into this predicament we're facing now. This graph shows human population growth from the time of Christ with projections of the planet's carrying capacity up to 2070. Until the discovery of antibiotics, vaccines, and medical innovations, natural checks and balances kept the human population from overwhelming our planet. But with these innovations, plus the Industrial Revolution and agricultural improvements, population grew exponentially. We have now polluted our world and our consumed natural resources to the point that we are causing environmental and wildlife destruction at the rate beyond nature's ability to restore itself. Now we have surpassed our planet's ability to sustain us all. With the present population growth, unless we address family planning, about 2 billion more people will be born in the next few decades, which will make the United Nations predictions unavoidable. Excess population is the root cause of increased competition for food, water, shelter, and jobs. The excess population is destroying society, causing an increase in drugs, crimes, suicide, and hunger. Human activities are causing droughts, storms, floods, fires, and erosion, pollution decimating economies, habitats, and wildlife. Some think a good old war will decrease our numbers. This is incorrect. We see how baby booms more than doubled our population after both world wars. So that is actually the worst possible solution. This NASA night photo taken from satellites shows only 40% of the world's population because the rest have no electricity. Let me illustrate what the United Nations predictions mean when they say civilization will end. For example, in 2017, a hurricane devastated parts of Puerto Rico. 
This destruction caused the end of living quarters, infrastructures, and sources of income. It compromised sources of food and water. And so, when hunger takes over, anarchy often follows. Two years later, the majority of destroyed services and structures in Puerto Rico have not been restored. So, for the afflicted, civilization ended. Although Puerto Rico belongs to the United States, there are insufficient funds to repair this damage. How can future areas of destruction in poorer nations be restored and repaired? Right now, due to the growing environmental and economic stress, is causing millions to flee their native lands, causing bigotry in nations where they seek asylum. Others engage in ethnic cleansing, ending their civilizations too. Yemen, Uganda, and Miramar are such examples. It was hunger that brought about the end of the Roman Empire, the French monarchy, and the Russian Revolution. No wall or army has proven strong enough to stop hungry people from invading. So we learned that feeding the hungry is key to achieving peace. So it does not take much imagination to see how in 11 years our entire civilization could end too. How can we avoid such a fate? First key is family planning. To stop this downward spiral above all, we must achieve socioeconomic stability. China enacted a law limiting one child per family, which helped it become the second largest economy in the world. But this encouraged aborting girls, so now many men can find wives. This damaged the very fabric of society and created selfish children because they had no brothers or sisters to keep them in check. Thailand too embraced birth control, but without coercion. This pulled the country out of poverty, and now, five years in a row, according to Bloomberg, it has been named the happiest economy in the world. Let's see how Thailand did it. Now, when I was a young man 40 years ago, the country was very, very poor with lots and lots and lots of people living in poverty. We decided to do something about it. But we didn't begin with a welfare program or a poverty reduction program, but we began with a family planning program following a very successful maternal child health activity, sets of activities. So basically, no one would accept family planning if their children didn't survive. So the first step, get to the children, get to the mothers, and then follow up with family planning. Why we needed to do it. In my country, that was the case in 1974. Seven children for family, tremendous growth at 3.3%. There was just no future. We needed to reduce the poverty and growth rate. So we said, let's do it. The women said, we agree, we'll use pills but we needed doctors to prescribe the pills. And we had very, very few doctors. So we didn't take no as an answer, we took no as a question. What do we do for the other 80%? Leave them alone and say, well, they're not medical personnel. No, we decided to do a bit more. So we went to the ordinary people that you saw, and they were terrific, and they practiced their family planning themselves. We went to the people who were seen as the cause of the problem to be the solution. So wherever there were people, and you can see most of the women, selling things, here's the floating market, selling bananas and crabs and also contraceptives. Wherever you find people, you will find contraceptives in Thailand. And then we decided, why not get to religion? And Thai people were Buddhists, so we went to them and they said, look, could you help for the monk to sprinkle holy water on pills and condoms for the sanctity of the family? And this picture was sent throughout the country. So some of the monks in the villages were doing the same thing themselves. And the women were saying, no wonder we have no side effects. It's been blessed. <laughs> that was their perception. And then we went to teachers. You need, you need everybody to be involved. 
in trying to provide whatever it is that makes humanity a better place. So we went to the teachers, over a quarter of a million were told about family planning with new alphabet, A, B for birth, C for condom, I for IUD, V for vasectomy. Again, education plus entertainment. And their kids were doing it in schools too. We had relay races with condoms. We had children's condom blowing championship. And before long, the condom was known as the girl's best friend. We introduced our first microcredit program in 1975. And women who organized it said, we only want to lend to women who practice family planning. If you're pregnant, take care of your pregnancy. If you're not pregnant, you can take a loan out from us. And that was run by them. And after 35, 36 years, it's still going on. It's part of the Village Development Bank. It's not a real bank, but it's a fund, microcredit. And we didn't need a big organization to run it. It was run by the villagers themselves. And you've probably hardly seen a Thai man there. It's always women, 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 women. And what happened in all this thing? from seven children to 1.5 children. And so that's the case of everyone joining in. We had, didn't have a strong government. We didn't have lots of doctors. But it's everybody's job who can change attitude and be. And after I gave them statistics, they said, yes, OK. You can use all the radio stations, television, everyone. And we said the public, uh, institutions, religious institutions, schools, everyone was involved, starting from university. And these are high school kids teaching high school kids. And the best teachers were the girls not the boys. And then we went down one more step. These are primary school kids, third, fourth grade, going to every household in the village, every household in the whole of Thailand, giving AIDS information and a condom to every household given by these young kids. And no parents objected because we were saved and trying to save lives. And this was a lifesaver. And then we gave condoms up everywhere in the streets, everywhere, everywhere. In taxis, you get condoms. And also in traffic, the policemen give you condoms, our cops and rubbers program. I gave this to El Gore and to Bill Senior also. Stop global warming, use condoms. There was political commitment, some financial commitment, and everybody joined the fight. So just don't leave it to the specialists, the doctors and nurses. We all need to help. And then we decided to help people out of poverty, this time not with government alone, but in cooperation with the business community. Because poor people are business people who lack business skills and access to credit. Those are the things to be provided by the business community. We're trying to turn them into barefoot entrepreneurs, little business people. The only way out of poverty is through business enterprise. So that was done. So the money goes from the company into the village via tree planting. So it's not a free gift. They plant the trees, and the money goes into their microcredit fund, which we call the Village Development Bank. Everybody joins in, and they feel they own the bank because they brought the money in. And before that, you can borrow the money. You need to be trained. And we believe if you want to help the poor, those who are living in poverty, access to credit must be a human right. Access to credit must be a human right. Otherwise, they'll never get out of poverty. And then before getting a loan, you must be trained. Here's a, what we call a barefoot MBA, teaching people how to do business so that when they borrow money, they'll succeed with the business. So these are some of the business, mushrooms, crabs, uh, vegetables, trees, fruits. And then now, finally, in education, we want to change the school as being underutilized into a place where it's a lifelong learning center for everyone. We call this our school-based integrated rural development, and it's a center, a focal point for economic and social development. So redo the school. Make it serve the community needs ground so they raise their own vegetables. And then finally, I firmly believe if we want the MDGs to work, the Millennium Development Goals, we need to add family planning to it. Of course, child mortality first, and then family planning. Everyone needs family planning service. It's underutilized. So we have now found the weapon of mass protection. So Thailand became prosperous by promoting birth control, education, women's empowerment, and small loans. This graph from the World Bank shows how Thailand compares to the world. The top line is Thailand. The lower one is the rest of the world. As you can see, Thailand surpasses the rest of the world. That is why it's number one. Nations that practice family planning are prosperous, educated, have low infant mortality, and have time to enjoy life and don't destroy their environment. We saw how Thailand, using the media, quickly 
educated all without legislation or expensive programs. They educated and handed free contraceptives to make this possible. Why? Studies show that for every dollar invested in contraception, seven dollars are saved. Why bring children to your home if the other ones are starving? That is a moral question. Right here in Dover, New Hampshire, I have children in my classroom who from the time they get their free lunch in school on Friday until the time they get breakfast in school on Monday have nothing to eat. Religions that don't accept contraception also have natural family planning, methods that must be encouraged so their followers do not suffer too. So family planning works. The second point to preventing the United Nations IPCC predictions is impacted by the food we love to eat. Carbon dioxide is a major cause of global warming. In an effort to reduce emissions, all nations agree to cut emissions in the Paris Climate Accord. But since then, we have continued destroying the forests at the rate which is canceling out any progress that might be made in that protocol. Why are we destroying the forests and habitats? Because in order to feed animals for human consumption, we must clear more and more land. The National Academy of Sciences calculates that plant, vegetable-based diets can reduce annually CO2 emissions up to 70%, saving $1.6 trillion per year worldwide. Animals raised for food use 40% of the world's arable land and consume 50% of the grain produced. So, if we stop eating chicken, meat, milk, eggs, etc., we can stop up to 70% of CO2 emission overnight. But there is another compelling reason why we must stop eating animal products. Because we learned that animal products are more deadly than tobacco. The World Health Organization in 2018 reported 8 million deaths from tobacco worldwide and 15 million deaths from eating animal products, processed foods, sugary and fatty meals. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics reports that about 60% of deaths from chronic disease are avoided by giving up animal-based foods and processed meals. In India, where religion encourages vegetarianism, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes is growing as this is partly caused by processed meals. We learned that one in three who eat animal flesh and processed foods will get diabetes, and one out of two will get cancer. In light of this, the Academy recommends a diet that avoids all these products except for infants who should only drink mother's milk. The National Academy of Sciences reports that eating animal-based and processed foods are linked to top cause of death and disease. Number one, cardiovascular disease. Next, cancer. Then diabetes, Alzheimer's, and immunological diseases. If we stop eating animal-based foods, the Academy notes that this will also prevent and keep in check or reverse diabetes, impotence, obesity, esophagogastric reflux, acidity, constipation, urinary incontinence, some arthritis, many allergies, many uh, skin conditions, osteoporosis, and Alzheimer's. Cancers and osteoporosis will be kept in check, provided these are also treated by current medical methods. The number one expenditure in the United States is healthcare. If we stop eating animal products and processed foods, feed this grain to people instead of animals, world hunger, our economies, environment, habitat destruction will substantially improve. Why don't most medical school teach us this and why doctors discourage us from this diet? Because healthy people don't go see the doctor. So beware of doctors who discourage you from adopting this lifetime diet. During my entire medical career, I never heard of this diet. About 15 years ago, when I became pre-diabetic, my cholesterol went through the roof and I gained 25 pounds. I learned of this diet 
which is a lifetime diet from Dr. Esselstein and Dr. Colin Campbell. Their work is documented in the video documentary Forks Over Knives. I embraced this diet for I could become with it healthy without taking any medications. But then, since then, I lost 25 pounds. My cholesterol and diabetes got cured for this makes us healthy and strong. See who embraced this plant-based diet. President Clinton, boxing world champion Mike Tyson, and TV entertainer Simon Cowell. You look wonderful. You look better than I've ever seen you in my life. So when you and I had to have our heart operations because of blockage, we know we didn't have enough to consume whatever it was we were consuming and live however we were living before then. So I changed my diet to try to drastically cut down on my cholesterol intake so this would never happen again. Mike Tyson is still fighting to change his life. I lost weight. I dropped over 100 pounds, but um, yeah, I just felt like changing my life, doing something different. And so I became a vegan. And um, becoming a vegan, it gave me another um, opportunity to live a healthy life. I could hardly breathe, high blood pressure, almost dying, and arthritis. And once I became a vegan, all that stuff, um, yeah, diminished. and was nominated as one of the most influential people in 2004 and 2010. On top of that, he went vegan two years ago and has since lost 20 pounds. He actually went vegan for health-related reasons. And since going vegan, it improved his memory, blood work and increased his subjective attractiveness. Changing to such a diet may even seem difficult and perhaps onerous. To achieve this, the change must be slow so we do not get discouraged or like New Year's resolution, it will not take hold. We have become addicted to our current diet. So like any addiction, we need to persevere and find others who give us support to achieve this goal. As our diet becomes more plant-based diet, we'll find that we are feeling better, we'll have no longer hunger pains, and our food budget is much more economical, and the nice thing is that we can eat all day without gaining weight. I can hear some of you thinking, I don't need this diet. My relatives are all healthy and eat fish, chips, bacon, legs every day and live to be 90. Well, you're playing Russian roulette. Because if you're healthy, with your regular diet that you're eating now, studies show that up to 50% of patients who suffer from sudden cardiac death had no symptoms and had normal laboratory studies, and all the examinations were normal. According to the American Heart Association, for the majority of Americans that die of heart disease, their first symptom occurs not years before they die, but literally minutes before they die. The number one cause of death in America is not just heart disease, but more specifically sudden cardiac death. People dropping dead in their 30s, 40s, 50s. Plant-based diets can prevent, successfully treat, and even reverse our number one killer. This will never happen if you follow this diet correctly. So cutting hamburgers, pizzas, sugary drinks, donuts, etc. is good for your health, the world's economy, and it's the quickest and the best thing we can do to save our environment. As you worry about our survival, some ask why we should conserve wildlife and habitats. Because we depend on nature, and if we destroy it, we destroy it ourselves. The journal Science and the United Nations report that show that the cost-benefit ratio of global conservation of natural habitats and protecting the wild is at least 100 to 1. They calculated that allowing wildlands to be transformed into farms or towns would diminish the global economic output by 18% by the year 2050. Here are examples of how the environment is so key to our survival. 
At least 75% of crops depend on bees and pollinators. Corals and planktons contribute to 75% of the world's oxygen and provide habitats. Yet, we keep on destroying these by raising more animals and in turn destroy our health, economy, and the environment. WHO has estimated that uh, 7 million deaths occur annually. Uh, premature deaths are occurring every year that are caused by exposure to air pollution, and this is obviously a major, major public health problem. This combined with growing populations that encroach on habitats and displace wildlife is a sure way to keep the predictions of our Anthropocene extinction that will come to pass. Over 11,000 scientists from over 150 countries agree and they have supported our recent publication in Bioscience. We suggest reducing meat consumption, moving away from an interest in improving GDP and looking at human health and well-being instead, and also slowing down and stabilising human population growth. If there is still time for people, policymakers and the business community to make the necessary changes to ensure that future generations can enjoy living on planet Earth. Conservation, recycling and shifting to clean renewable energy are essential to avert environmental damage. But these efforts are insufficient if we do not address family planning and the food we eat. We know the combination of farmed animals Food process in the healthcare industry, which includes pharmaceuticals, are the top causes of CO2 emissions. Another top cause of pollution, hunger and economic loss, is the food we waste. Curbing these losses and wasting good food will help feed the poor so they don't revolt and we can save up to 2.4 trillion a year that can be used for education and restoring the planet. This sum is about the amount of money that United States budget spent in 2018. Nations that refuse to encourage change in diet, refuse to support family planning programs, and will not take steps to avoid food waste or adhere to the United Nations Climate Accord projects, must have their products slapped with carbon tariffs to mitigate the damage their carelessness cause. Only through sustained individual and group efforts can we avoid the worst outcomes of climate change. Personal international cooperation. Unfortunately, many are unaware of these dangers and many are in denial. Education through the media is vital if this gap is to be resolved so we can above all have worldwide cooperation. The Organization Population Media Center uses soap operas and radio shows to educate about the importance of family planning, empowering women in societies to educate millions in over 50 nations. Their impact has been very positive. This is the image of the fires worldwide seen from space in 2018. In summary, Civilization will collapse in about 11 years unless we change our way of life. To ignore this prediction and hope things will work out by themselves is playing Russian roulette with our lives and our grandchildren's future. If we wait too long to heed this advice, it will be too late, a scientist warned, and then it will be impossible to restore the world we enjoy and love so well. Yes, it is difficult to give up dreams of having a large family or of continuing to consume a diet based on meat and processed foods. But just like giving up a gangrenous foot that threatens to end one's life, we must give up these if we hope to thrive and leave future generations a place to live in dignity and peace. I ask, how can people help themselves if they don't know what these facts are? How can they prevent this catastrophe if no one tells them how? It is up to us 
to alert all and to provide hope. We have the knowledge and resources to prevent civilization's collapse. By harnessing social and mass media, we must alert everyone while we still have time so we can all succeed. The solutions are simple and economical. Birth control and changing our diet to non-processed vegan diet. This will help us become prosperous, healthy, and lead us to a hopeful future. A future where we can share a world in which we can live in dignity, harmony, and peace. A place we can all call home. We have no time to spare. Let's not face the day when our grandchildren, surrounded by devastation, ask us, if you knew about this, why didn't you do something about it while there was still time? Why didn't you tell us how to avoid all this? Thank you 